All right, I think we're ready. We're gonna do two things today. One, we're gonna look at uh, some flexible material printing with rubber material on a FDM printer. Um, and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna look at a piece of software. This is an industrial piece of software in topology. Um, we're gonna look at a tiny piece of it, maybe like 2% of it or whatever, just to kind of give you an idea of, of what other types of things are out there other than just SolidWorks and Fusion 360 and things like that. Um, this this piece of software is it's kind of you can do modeling with it and uh, like you could in SolidWorks but not not quite the same it's really meant for you have a model and then you want to optimize it for some purpose and a lot of what those purposes are, are probably additive manufacturing um, not necessarily FDM style additive manufacturing but probably more of the SLA or the um, uh, selective laser melting centering you know like for metal um, one of those style is probably what it's really for. Um, I don't have one of those. Well, I guess I, we have the resin printers, but um, we're kind of sticking to the FDM stuff here. Um, so I will show you how you can do some interesting things. Not that you couldn't do this particular job in another piece of software, even not that difficult. Um, but uh, it, there is one part of it that, that this does that could be useful. Um, I don't know if you can get... a you can get a trial version of this, but I don't know how much you can actually do with the trial version. So this is more like just something out there in industry that uh, you might run into at some point if you enter an industry where your primary thing is that you're gonna additively manufacture something. First, let's just talk about the flexibles in general though. Um, so I printed this, this little guy. Um, this is a jaw, a soft jaw for a vise, so it would you know, a vi like a bench vise where it's going to clamp something together. Um, normally they have uh, metal jaws in them, but maybe sometimes you want to clamp something that is not, um, or that would be marred if you clamped it in a metal jaw. So um, I don't have a set of soft jaws specifically for that. So I printed, or we made this guy in Tinkercad and then the in topology program and printed it. So this orange is flexible here. You can kind of get an idea this is the brim. It was, I printed it like this. Uh, and uh, So there wasn't a whole lot holding it down, so I did attach a brim to it. And uh, this is the kind of thing, you know, this is flexible, just like a, uh, a rubber material. This is one of the stiffer ones. They are much softer flexible materials than this, too. But this, this, so this one is a little bit more stiff, but you can definitely see uh, this. This is flexible. You know, it's a little bit rigid because I've got all this uh, feature on it. Um, I didn't dial in the settings just right. And actually, this is a hard thing for flexibles to do anyway. But let's see if we can get close enough to pick up some of the... Uh, it may not may not focus very well. You can kind of pick it up. It actually looks really red there. It's, it's actually orange, but the picture looks really red. Yeah, you can see. You can see inside there where there's a little bit of stringing. Flexible materials have a hard time retracting. Um, why don't I, let me, let me get another roll. This one's still in the printer. So here is one of the softer ones. This is much softer material. I didn't even try printing this one, um, but just so you can see, let's zoom out so you can see. This is what a flexible, I mean, you could tie this stuff in a knot here, you know, and this is the filament. Uh, this, this amount of flex is gonna be harder to print on a printer like a Ender 3 with the Bowden tube. Um, this particular one is this. It's one of the. It's a Ninja Tech um, printing temperature. This is pretty typical for uh, the flexibles in the 220 to 230 range. Um, we'll look at what I use for this one when I go through the settings. Um, bed temperature. I think I did 50 degrees Celsius. This one's saying you could be room temperature if you wanted to be. Slow. This one's really slow. I printed at 30 millimeters per second for the orange material. This one's recommending 10 to 20, but this one is much, I mean, this stuff is really flexible. Um, so you would have to go slow. Um, I will try this on the ender with the Bowden tube, but 
Um, the printer, the, the material that's so flexible like this, you're probably going to need a um, direct drive printer so that there's no, no real slop in the uh, system. If you have any gaps or anything like that um, with the, something this flexible, it's just going to ooze out of the gap. It'll make a big curl uh, where it won't go in the hot end. It'll just find the path of least resistance. And if you have a little gap anywhere, uh, even between your feeder and the Bowden tube, a little gap there, um, you're, it's just going to push out that gap, particularly something this, this flexible. The orange stuff is, a, you know, it's more rigid. You know, it's still one layer of it, still really flexible though. Um, but it will have a little bit better chance of not going in all these little openings that you might have somewhere. Um, I do have a Capricorn Bowden tube on the Ender 3. Um, and so that does have a tighter tolerance. So it's uh, the inside diameter is much closer to the size of the filament, the 1.75 millimeters. So assuming the filament is the right size, then it will do better printing flexibles with the Capricorn tubing because it, there's just less slack. You know, this is really springy. So whenever your feeder pushes on it, it wants to do this kind of thing. So if you have as, as little slack as possible, that does increase the friction inside there so you can have some clogging issues if you're trying to print too fast but um, you have a better chance of actually getting it to come out of the nozzle um, I also this says use glue stick for bed adhesion on this stuff what I did is I used this and it worked really well I used the Aquanet extra super hold from the dollar store or, or from some cheap store I don't know this is <laughs> seems like the, the less you can pay for the hairspray, the better it's going to work on this. So the really thick, gunky stuff um, works really well for holding down parts on a print bed. Um, so it kind of prints, other than the slow, that might be the one thing that surprises you is that you do have to print this really slowly. Um, the other thing, what I was actually originally starting was, I do have um, a little bit of stringing in here because it's difficult to get retraction going um, because if you're constantly you know pushing on the filament and then pulling on it you know to retract if the feeder is having to pull it back and then push pull it back push you, you end up with a lot of springiness in that system particularly on the longer Bowden tube setups um, and retraction can get difficult to do um, so I just turn con retraction completely off um, I you with the orange here they do like I say they do have materials with different shore values so the uh, rubberiness of it and um, I could, probably could uh, use some retraction uh, and it'd be okay this one something like this probably uh, you couldn't, couldn't do retraction at all even even on a direct drive system this one might give you problems with retraction I will try printing something with it um, we have one more class um, so if I can get something to print with it I'll show it to you next time on Wednesday um, but it's 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 really interesting. This one actually feels, um, I don't know how to describe it. it. It's a little bit textured, almost a little bit gritty, sandy feeling. Um, typically, t flexibles don't need a special nozzle. You can print them on a um, brass nozzle just fine. Uh, I do have that Nozzle X, so it's a hardened steel nozzle and it's coated. So probably will have a better chance on printing in this 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 material I probably should print on one of the direct drive printers uh, just to see but I'll try it on the Ender 3 to see if I can get it to print um, this material also well all of these they're typically TPU and most flexibles are uh, and that's a another one of the materials that's really hydroscopic so it's going to absorb moisture pretty quickly um, and so you do need to keep them sealed up um, or try and bake them beforehand or put them in a bunch of desiccant. Uh, you know, if I use this thing. I showed it before, but I'll show it again. I use this thing. can't tell what it is. There it is. A little filament dryer or a single roll filament dryer. So it's got a little heater in the bottom, a little control panel over here that... Uh, that lets you set a temperature and a time for it to basically bake. Um, you can technically do that in something like a, an, a toaster oven. Um, you probably don't want to do it in your actual oven. Um, for one thing, most actual ovens that you're going to cook food in, 
um, are not going to go to a low enough temperature. And um, you might think you're okay. Uh, you put the roll in there and you, you drop it down below the glass transition temperature of the filament. But usually the problem on that is the, the filament holder, the spool, uh, is going to warp and melt on you before the filament does. Uh, and so you actually end up melting the spool holder. The filament's kind of okay, but then you've got this melted spool holder all around it. So don't really, don't think you can go down to like 200 degrees or whatever. The lowest your oven will go and be okay. That That's going to be probably too much to um, for the filament spool holder itself. Um, so you really need, if you want to do the drying of a filament, ABS, uh, a nylon or a TPU, something like that, you don't really need to dry PLA. I, I, even here where it's really humid, I've never really dried PLA. Um, you can, but I don't know that it makes much difference. Uh, but the others, it does make a difference. Um, and if you're going to try and dry one, either get one of the filament drying devices. You know, now I saw that they're they're relatively affordable. Um, let's see what it is now. I looked at it last time we were talking about it. Yeah, it's $42. So that's on Amazon. Uh, actually, there's one for $40. It's got a 20% coupon on it. Um, so I would get one of those instead of trying. I would not try my food oven. If you have a toaster oven that you kind of use for other things shop related, then those will go down low enough if it'll fit in there. Um, if the filament will fit in there, then you could probably do that. Um I like these things though for if you need to dry filament it, it does only well there are some that have more than one spot in them the ones that I've seen uh, that I have only have one spot for filament you know you don't have two spots um, but you know $40 that's that's not a bad deal if you think you're gonna do this often uh, the roll of filament typically the rolls of filament you need to dry other than ABS are about $40 for a roll uh, so I would do it that way. If you don't want to do it that way, what you do is you just get you a big bucket and you can buy desiccant, not the little packets. You can buy actual like buckets of desiccant. Um, but here you're at, uh, now this is a rechargeable. You, you need to do your research on the rechargeable desiccants because, um, uh, they have the same type of issue. Well, not the same type of issue. They release, uh, when you recharge them, you have to heat them. And when they release the whatever it is they release, um, that's not necessarily a, a good thing. And I don't remember which color is the one that has some harmful chemicals in it. Um, I think the blue to pink is the heart, the harsh chemicals when you, you don't want those in your oven that you're going to cook food in. Um, this one might not be so bad. This might be the microwave one. I don't remember. Um, but there are rechargeable desiccant packets that change color. So you see when they um, are filled with moisture. Um, so you could get a bucket and some desiccant and dump it in there. But at that point, you know, you're, you're in the range of buying one of the filament dryers. So I don't know. If you're going to do the filament drying, then this is good. If you're just trying to store maybe PLA or you've got dry material and you just want to keep it dry, then, you know, get you a big tub, pour some of the desiccant in the bottom of it and uh, put all your filament in there uh, and just kind of keep it dry versus uh, drying it afterwards. Um, so if you can get it and keep it dry, then probably you're OK with a little bit cheaper option is get a big tub that you can seal pretty airtight. It doesn't have to be like a locker type thing, but uh, something that's relatively airtight and put desiccant in the bottom of that, and you can seal it that way. Um, anyway, TPU is one of those materials that you kind of have to dry uh, if you uh, notice that it's popping or anything like that while you're printing. Uh, that's moisture evaporating from it right at the nozzle, and you're going to get a bad surface finish. TPU, you're, you're going to have a hard time with the surface finish anyway, um, unless you have a print that doesn't really need any sort of... Um, retraction doesn't doesn't really jump around from point to point um, in fact if you look on thingiverse for the squishy models and things like that you, you kind of see that they print in a way that doesn't need um, retraction uh, the ones that are designed to be uh, printed on a flexible material don't need a lot of a retraction or any retraction 
settings uh, to, to print successfully. All right, um, so let's go over to, let's go to my slicer that I set up, where's that? Here it is. So here are the settings. Oh, the brand that I used was, I don't know how you say it, Preline or Priline, but uh, it, that's the brand. I don't even know if it's a thing anymore. Let's see. Silicon filament, is it still flexible? I don't even know that there, let me see if there is such a thing. Um, wow, this must be why, oh, that's PLA. Here's what I have. It's one of the cheaper ones. This orange material is one of these. Uh, silicone filament. I assume you mean silicone. Um, I've never actually heard of that. Unless, unless TPU and silicone are the same type of material. Um, silicone TPU. Hmm. So the ones that I see that say anything with, well, this is like a case. Maybe, maybe TPU and silicone are the same material. I don't actually know what TPU even stands for, to be honest. I never looked it up. Um, I just know that that's the um, material that a lot of these are made from. These phone cases apparently are silicone TPU. So I don't see any filament, at least on Amazon, that says it's silicone unless TPU is silicone. We can, we could, is TPU silicone, not silicone, silicone. Okay, so TPU is a, a hybrid of silicone and polycarbonate. That's a, a two opposite kind of things. Um, thermoplastic polyurethane is what TPU stands for. Now we know. And no one's have to battle. All right, so that's interesting. So um, I, I've, I've never seen a pure silicone filament. Um, but I would assume that would, it would be flexible if there is such a thing. Uh, let me type in silicone filament and see if I can find one. Huh. I don't see one particularly. I think I think TPU is going to be the thing that uh, you can find. Now, if you if you have a source for a silicone uh, filament, let me know because that's interesting. Um, silicone has some cool properties that other materials don't have, mainly that it doesn't stick to anything except other silicone. Um, so that would be kind of interesting if there was a silicone filament, because it you would think that it wouldn't get stuck in their nozzle or anything. You, it wouldn't have clogs, um, but it may not be on its own. It may not be a thermoplastic that can be heated and printed. That I don't know. Um, all right. So um, I bought, what I was saying is I had this version and it is TPU, this kind of stuff. So kind of the cheaper one, the higher end TPU is usually uh, a material called uh, Ninja Flex. Um, that one that I had over here, I've never used. It was a sample of Ninja Tech, not the same thing, I don't think, although that's similar to their logo. Maybe it's just one of their brands. Um, this particular one, I was going to tell you about it too. Um, it does have... Uh, mentioned that it is skin safe um, so it's it's uh, even in their uh, write up here I think that yeah uh, fashion part so it's made to be like a wearable thing that you uh, wanted to print um, some people might have uh, reactions to some of the printed material I don't think TPU is one that particularly gets a reaction if it particularly if it's a hybrid of silicone and um, polycarbonate I guess you could be reactive to polycarbonate I don't know, but uh, I've never, never tested that. Um, let's go to our settings that I used. So here's a little model, um, and as you can see, the brim that I uh, had to use around it. Well, I don't know. I only printed it one time. It worked fine the first time, um, so I don't know if I needed the brim or not. But there was really only these tiny little strips of contact the way I was printing this. Um, so I was pretty sure I was going to need something to hold it down. And so I just used a pretty big brim there. Um, let's see, the filament settings. So I used, well, all of these are pretty normal. Um, I set it at 230 for the temperature that was kind of the probably the upper end. I could probably drop that down a little bit. Um, but again, I didn't tune any of this. I just printed it. 
Uh, I did have the bed at 50 with the hairspray on it. Um, let's go to our cooling. I, I ran the fan, um, I ran it at half speed. And typically, you don't max out the fan on uh, the TPU, the flexible type printer printing materials. Um, so I did want to run some fan because I knew that all these little ridges, all these little ridges I have in here were going to want to be really stringy. Uh, oh, the name of the software I'm using here is just Super Slicer. So it's a, um, so let me get it on the screen up here or up there, Super Slicer. Um, it is, the reason I have it, is because it has a, a pre-configured um, Marlin, uh, not Marlin, instead of Marlin, it has Clipper on it, and which I have on this printer. So if I go to the printer settings, uh, G-code flavor, you know, most of the time you're running Marlin, so any of, the, any of the firmware we've used up until when we put Clipper on this one was Marlin. Um, so the TH3D, uh, the Marlin, uh, the stuff that ships on the printer is Marlin. They're all based on Marlin, but this Super Slicer does have a specific one for Clipper. Um, and so that's why I'm using it with the Clipper um, firmware that's running on this printer now. Um, you, could, you, would, you wouldn't have to do that. You could Clipper interprets Marlin pretty much just fine. But since this one does have a specific option to choose that, that's why I'm using it. So Super Slicer is a skinned version with a few additions of Prusa Slicer which is a fork of Slicer. So they're all in that line. So that's what this software is free. It's another free one. Um, let's see. Nothing odd there. There's nothing in the multi-material. Um, I did set my retraction length to zero. So basically that's in Cura, the same as just unchecking retraction. Uh, I probably could have some amount of retraction if I wanted to print a bunch of TPU and tune it. Um, I can print some with this because the the Pryline or Pryline, whichever, Preline, I don't know. Um, that material, this material, oh, not that one, this one. Um, it is much, much more rigid than what I was showing with this blue stuff over here. This blue stuff is uh, like stringing almost. So um, I, I'm pr pretty sure I couldn't have any retraction when I try to print that, uh, what's it even called? Uh, Ninja Tech. It's kind of off the screen there. Um, let's see, did I change anything else? I don't think I did. Um, these are all printer settings. Print set, well, I turned on a brim here. I did that, but I often do that anyway. Um, so when you're printing the flexible, flexible materials, the material itself is flexible. Um, but you also control the flexibility through the number of perimeters and the infill. So you obviously more perimeters of even the softer material is going to be kind of rigid. Uh, so I, I did two perimeters. So that's, I, don't, I really don't like doing just one perimeter of anything unless it's a vase mode type thing that's meant to be a single perimeter. Um, so I, I at least want two generally. Um, but if I'm trying to build a functional part, then that's probably a four on the perimeters or the walls. Um, Top and bottom, I, I a lot of times do more top than bottom layers. In this case, the bottom layers are almost non-existent, right? Because it's just, it's just this little, it's just sitting on the bed with like one little strip that's on the bottom. Um, so there's not a whole lot on the bottom anyway. Um, but I did have that at three. Normally I would have that around three, maybe a little higher for a normal print on a, um, on a softer one. Obviously, if you print the top and bottom thicker than the number of walls you have, then you're going to have some, um, which might be a good thing or might be a bad thing, but you, you're going to have some unequal uh, rigidness on your print. Ideally, you kind of want the top and bottom and perimeters to all have the same amount of layers on them, around them. Um, and so if I, I would do two top, two bottom, two walls, that would give kind of uniform flexibility. Um, except two top layers, a lot of times it's going to look bad. Um, now, again, in this orientation, there's very little on the top. You know, there's, there's only this little ridge that are top layers. So it probably wouldn't make any difference. Um, I wanted to print it this way so that I didn't have to use support material because I did not want to try and dig support material out of all of these little uh, hexagons anywhere. That would have been no fun. 
particularly um, you can do support with TPU, but it it doesn't work particularly well at all. Um, and so if you can arrange your part to not need supports, if you're printing a flexible material, that's going to be much better in the long run. Um, just the way supports work, you know, it prints these little thin walls um, kind of in a zigzag pattern. You can change that. Um, and I would, I would change it to one of the grid patterns for uh, the supports if you really wanted to use supports and a flexible material. Either print with two materials, like two nozzles, or um, don't print with supports, or change the support pattern to one of the grids so it's not just the thin walls in a zigzag because they're going to they're going to fall down and not really work at all. Um, but I was most interested in just not even having to use supports. Um, let's see, I didn't change, so I, so I did do four top layers, although, so that's not the same as the number of walls I had, but uh, in this orientation, there's really not any top layers anyway. Um, same thing with the bottom layers. And I don't think I, ch oh, speed. Um, I did, I did 35, I thought I did 30, but um, I did 35 apparently um, for the uh, printing speed. Um, I didn't even, uh, normally you can print infill faster, but in this case, um, I just, the, pushing the flexible material through a Bowden tube, this is a relatively short Bowden tube on this printer, but still, um, you want to go pretty slow. And again, this material over here recommends, you know, 10 to, 10 to 20 mil millimeters per second. So very slow. The, the orange, the printed fine at 35, it was not a problem. Um, other than there is, if, if you could see it, there are um, strings inside the hexagons. They're just hard to see on the camera, um, but they are there. They're not bad, but they are there. All right. Um, so as a recap about, you know, PETG type temperatures, maybe a little lower, 220 to 230 for your heat bed. Slow down. Um, 35 is probably going to be pretty fast unless you have a direct drive printer. So if you have a Bowden tube, Ender 3, uh, or any kind of printer that has the tube separating the feeder from the actual print head, then you're going to have to go slower. Um, control the stiffness through the number of walls and infill. I don't know what infill I used in here. Let's see. 15%. I used a gyroid pattern, although it doesn't... The pattern will affect, you know, which direction it has uh, strength in. So um, gyroid is kind of uniform. Uh, and I did a pretty low infill, 15%. And, it, and this part is still really rigid because this material um, is much more rigid than this, but it's still, you know, still flexible. It's not, uh, not like ABS or PLA or something. Um, let's see. So control your stiffness with walls and infill. Um, probably no retraction. Or very little retraction if you want to print a whole bunch then it's probably worth tuning your retraction um, I just did I, I did the one sample I guess I need to print one more to have a pair of soft jaws for the vise um, cooling I did use some cooling that one is probably going to be um, so the blue over here says cooling yes after layer two that's typical um, you've used the first couple of layers to really stick down to the print bed, so no cooling on those. Um, and then after layer two, it doesn't say what percentage. I did 50%. You could probably do 100% and be okay. Um, and then I did print with the heated bed on at 50, uh, 50 degrees Celsius. That probably, um, the heated bed with the, with the hairspray uh, it does seem to work better than just the hairspray by itself in general across the board to me. Um, and then the rest of the slice, you know, it just works the same as that. Um, the other thing I liked about this Super Slicer software is, if I go over here, this button. Um, so I can do get all my slice set up, get it ready, hit this button, and it sends it to the printer. So it's, I don't have to go over to here. I don't have to go over here and uh, this is the front end for the clipper software that's running on the Ender 3. I don't have to go over here. I could. I could load it into this and then print um, but this one integrates directly and so I can just hit this button send a printer and it just does it. I don't 
have to worry with it. So that's another reason. Uh, Perusa Slosher might do that. I don't know. Um, I've never tried setting it up on there. I just know that this one does. Um, and this is very much like Prusa Slicer. In fact, it's built on top of Prusa Slicer. <clears throat> All right. Um, let's also, let's look at the way I did this thing. So actually, let's start over here. So what I did is I built this. So I needed some, like I said, the we're going to transition over to this in topology software that um, I was talking about. Um, so I needed some base geometry to work with. Now this geometry is so simple. I could have built it directly in, in topology, but, um, I haven't, I've only used this software a little bit. I've, um, they gave me a, a one year license to, you know, do this kind of thing with, um, and they, that wasn't that long ago. So I haven't messed with it a whole lot. So I'm sure you could build this pretty easy because it's two rectangles. Um, and so that's all I did. It's just two rectangles. So two boxes, uh, 110 by, I think I made that 20 by five or 10 by five, 110, 10 by five. And I welded them together. So then I exported that. Um, I don't remember if I did, I think I did both and both will work in object or a STL file. Um, I think I ended up using the STL. We'll see in a minute. All right. So actually let's go to the in topology website so you can kind of see what it's what it's about so it is a, it does label itself as a design software um, and you can design straight from there there is a demo um, but it is meant for industrial use so it and like like SolidWorks and things like that um, they're meant for industrial use but they do have a consumer either free or very cheap version I don't know that this does um, yeah. normally when you have to request a quote they're not very cheap um, but anyway you can get a demo of it and I, and you can play around with their pre-built stuff I just don't think you can add your models to it with the demo um, so you can get a feel for how the software works and things like that and what they've pre-built um, I just don't think you can do a whole lot on you being your own creative version um, so here's kind of the, the ideas of what it does. Um, you can get a free account though. Uh, and it is an interactive demo. Again, it lets you play around with it. Um, and apparently there is a 14 day trial that you can use to play for two weeks with it, uh, to, to actually bring in your own soft, uh, own models and, and whatnot. Um, so here's kind of what they're doing. You know, there's some, um, specialized lattice so it's used for lightweighting objects so you have a, a model and uh, you want to make it lighter but still structurally sound uh, it will basically let you control the way the infill for a 3d print uh, would be created um, that's one thing it'll do um, it can add surface finishes so here this is a um, I guess this is the yeah this is a hip part of a hip so the femur ball would be up here on the top um, and this would drive down into your femur <laughs> so um, if you break your hip uh, that's what oh, it, what happens um, and this surface here has to integrate with the bone so it's a osteo, osteo integrative surface there and so what they've done is uh, they have modeled different uh, voids and textures onto this uh, 3d printed femoral stem for a hip joint um, how they do this in the past is they just kind of melt beads onto there um, and those beads are also creating the increased surface area for the bone to grow into and here they're modeling them those features directly into the the implant um, so that's one thing you could do is you could add surface features that's what I did. I just added that hexagon. Um, they have a lot of examples here on heat exchangers, kind of like here, a heat sink that has got a lot more surface area inside it than just your vertical fins. And a lot of this is built around the idea that um, there's no way, let's see if I can get this bigger. Uh, I lost it. It didn't really get bigger. Um, there's no way you could machine this shape, right? Um, you could get close on a, you know, five or six axis type machine but you'd never get down inside of here. But if you have a printer that can print this shape, 
in metal, since it's a heat sink, uh, then you can you can have any shape you want. And so you can have a lot more surface area in there. Um, and that's another feature that they have. Um, here's some more of what kind of like the, what we did with the topology optimization. So it does have a finite element based simulation piece to it. I haven't done anything with that. Um, but here they're, they're optimizing topology. So it has that. Um, here's some more internal geometry optimized. I don't even know what this thing is. Um, it says air, it's in the aerospace field. Maybe it's an engine. Um, maybe that's a rocket engine. I don't know. Medical devices, some industrial design. There's an automotive. This is just making a cool pattern. Um, you know, things like that. So it's relatively new, the best I can tell. Um, and it is meant primarily as a industrial tool for additive manufacturing. So you're going to make your parts using the additive process. Um, and there are, there are machines that can print metal usable parts. Um, and there are machines that can print, um, resin based. So kind of like the resin printer, except it uses, usually they either directly deposit particles, um, like an inkjet printer would, or they cure with a laser kind of like what the one I showed off a few weeks ago does, except that one uses UV light. Um, and so, and those parts end up solid. They, they are pretty much isotropic and isomorphic, I guess. Um, and so they, they don't, um, they don't have quite the same issues that, uh, a FDM style of 3d printed part would with the layer adhesion. They don't have quite that issue. Um, and so if you have that kind of manufacturing set up, then you want to take advantage of it because now you can print any geometry you want, uh, pretty much. And so that's kind of their, their goal here is, is that's what they're aiming for. Um, okay. So that's a heat exchanger. Um, all right. So you can get to your demo. So here, here's what it looks like when you open it up. Actually, it doesn't have all of this, you know, this is not here when you open up, that's our part. Um, it has a, a workflow that it, it's not intuitive, but it makes sense um, once you figure out what's going on with it. So I would definitely say it is, you would need some tutorials or some guidance um, to just figure this thing out. Um, you have across the top here, basically your different, um, how many, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 different categories for types of things you might wanna do. So create is there's where we could use primitive geometry to, we could have created our um, little L shape vice uh, soft gel um, pretty easily with some rectangles. So that's not a big deal. We could have made that. Um, modeling, actually we could do some modeling in here also. Um, this is, um, you know, you have things like offsets and maybe you have a, a surface model and you want to thicken it up um, like the scan that I made earlier um, from the photogrammetry that just ends up as a shell. This is one way you could thicken it. Um, I don't know if it's the best way. I didn't use this, but uh, you might could. Um, there's a loft between profiles, you know, SolidWorks Fusion 360, you create two, two cross sections and loft between them. So it's got that kind of thing. I would, I would definitely think that this is not where I would start if I were trying to model something. Um, if I knew how to use SolidWorks or Fusion 360, or in this case, even Tinkercad, that's where I started. Um, I, I haven't used a lot of their modeling p features here. I just don't think that they're going to be competitive with somebody who knows one of the actual modeling packages. But the good thing is you can model your base part over in any of those and then bring it in here. Um, now this particular part would have been fine here, but, um, you've got some Boolean operations. So this is, this is like a very sophisticated Tinkercad type of setup here. Um, but I don't think it is the same approach as like Fusion 360 or SolidWorks. I will have to try that out to be sure, um, but I don't know. Um, here are some of those lattices. So there's the uh, kind of uh, like we saw with the heat sink. Um, here's some where you can uh, manipulate the surface features by pulling and pushing vertices. Uh, maybe you want a, a pattern of some sort. Um, I might could have used this 
to create this hexagon on here. It's not what I did though. Um, similar things over here in the fields. I don't know as much about what they're doing in this part. Um, so I didn't use this part at all. Um, so I don't, I don't really know what's in the field. You, you, you can actually generate um, mathematical functions to create patterns. Um, here's the FEA type stuff where you have the topology optimization and the um, distress analysis and things like that. Um, I didn't do that with this model either, but um, it seems pretty straightforward on, on working with that. It, we, I did run through it a little bit, and, it, and basically you add constraints, you add loads, um, you mesh the model. Um, there's, some, there's some little bits that you have to be careful of that only certain types of models, so there's CAD models, there's mesh models, there's bodies, um, and so only certain features will do certain things. Like for a, a, um, for a static analysis, you have to have a particular type of mesh set up for that to work. And so there's some, some little nuances that um, take a while to figure out. Um, in here, utilities, I did use this um, as this is where I exported my 3MF. So that's what the file I printed. The 3MF is one of the uh, modeling files that uh, you can, it's like a STL file. Um, and so that one uh, I is what I printed. So in fact, you can see it right here. This block is exporting this. Um, here's some conversion. So you, you need to go from um, the, between those different bodies, mesh, body, CAD, um, that's how you get between the different ones here. So you can see in, in the very first thing that I did, um, so these are all nested. So this, this is inside, this one is inside this one. These are inside this union. Um, so it's all kind of nested together. And um, the very first thing I actually did was import the Tinkercad model. Um, and that is... That was this block? No, it's this. No, that's the output block. It's mesh to, I think it will, we'll do it in a second. Uh, I've kind of lost which blocks are where now. Um, manufacturing, uh, this is more like your, you can actually use this as a slicer to set up your slices. Um, now this part of it wouldn't work with the FDM printer. I don't think this is really set up to go to these particular file types, which are file types read by certain types of printers. And these are not FDM printers, like image slices and uh, things like that for SLA and um, laser centering and those type of printers. So this tab I didn't use at all. Um, there is an additive manufacturing tab. Um, again, these kind of are set up for particular printers, Renshaw, EOS, Renam. So these are particular printers that I don't have. Um, build prep um, this is kind of getting your slices together uh, orienting your model on the build plane and that kind of thing um, i didn't use a lot even though it's the added manufacturing you would think it's the one i would use um, it's this particular tab is really set up for um, those particular applications which are not fdm um, architected materials um, i don't think i used this one I, you, I might could have some of the emboss and deboss could have done this kind of featuring over here. Here's some more design analysis. Um, that's similar type stuff to the uh, simulation. Light weighting is what I did use. So here are some surface features that you can use. Um, uh, I have a couple of them already in here. Let's turn some of the others on. Um, so if I turn off this one, these little buttons hide different things. <clears throat> I just got to find the right ones. That one, all right. So here is a um, structural ribbing. So an example of uh, this this one right here, structural ribbing. Uh, so you can you can control the spacing. So where'd it go? If I open it up, um, I'm on a rib height of one. Maybe I want a rib height of two, and so it'll regenerate um, with you know thicker ribs here um, or maybe you want a, a more dense or less dense pattern so you can change the count on your pattern there and, and increase it or decrease it so it's all generated generated on the fly um, you choose the face so this CAD face option right here 
if I click CAD face zero, if I show it, um, I have chosen or selected this face to apply that algorithm to. Um, and so on, over here on the left, it's sort of like you're programming in a computer language. Um, you don't write out code necessarily, but you have all these functions. The functions have all these parameters. You change the parameters to change the output from the function. And you can enable or disable various functions. Um, let's see, let's turn that one off. And here's a perforate body. That was one of these in here, perforate body. So here, actually that one I'll have to turn this off for. So it basically just drills holes through everything. So maybe you wanna lightweight it by just drilling holes in everything. Um, it has some options on what face do you want to drill holes through? You know, what, what orientation do you want the holes to be? So this, actually that one, that one doesn't look any different. Mm. Because I'm, that's just rotating the holes about the Y axis and I think Y must, why is that way though? Hmm. That didn't, that didn't work the way I thought it would. They all seem to do the same thing. Um, anyway, <laughs> I don't know why it's, uh, oh, maybe I need to do a rotation angle here. I don't know what each parameter is exactly. Tell there we go. We got it to go at an angle now. So now the holes are going through that way. If you wanted holes in the thing. Um, what else did I have? Here's some uh, pattern. Veroni pattern. Uh, I don't actually know how you pronounce that word. Veroni. I don't know. Um, again, you pick a face to apply it to. So if we turn back on the body, then you can kind of see where it would go. Um, and it's a somewhat random pattern. Um, it looks sort of regular. This side looks a little less regular than this side. Um, it has, you know, some variables that you can manipulate to make the pattern more or less random or, or whatever you think, you can make them smaller. Um, you can turn off the auto um, generate also, so it doesn't constantly generate new patterns every time you type a new number in. Make a lot more of them. Uh, so it's all a generative type thing based on some algorithms. Um, and there there is quite a bit of um, setup learning how this thing works. Um, so if you've done some coding before, if you're familiar with, you know, order of operate, not order of operations as far as a math, you know, PIMDAS type thing, but uh, um, algorithm, you know, how is this, how does this block affect this block, affect this one and so forth, then, then you can make sense of this. It's still, it's gonna take either some reading, at least each one of these blocks has this little question mark that explains what all of its options, what it's expecting for that and what it does. Um, so th that's good, um, but it still takes some some getting used to on, on how this process actually works, um, unless you've done something similar. Maybe if you've used a, um, sort of like the mesh room has its sequence of uh, operations that's gonna be performed on the scans that you, or the pictures that you took, um, or if you use Grasshopper plugin for Rhino, uh, any of those algorithmic type things, you might have a good chance of just coming into this and understanding it right away. Um, if, you've, if none of those make sense, then it will require some tutorial video watching, which they do have. Intopology has some good um, text and video walkthroughs of how to get some of this stuff to work because there's lots of frustrating little things about um, uh, <clears throat> like this particular you know, this needs a CAD face. Well, how do I gener generate a CAD face? I need a CAD body. Well, how do I have a CAD body? Because I have a STL file and it's not a CAD file. And so you have to change the STL over to a CAD body so that you can select a CAD face. And there's a lot of, a lot of little prerequisite type things that you have to work through. Um, but once you do all that, it's not, it's pretty, pretty easy then to generate lots of different things on here. 
I say it's easy. Uh, let's try one and see if I can actually get it to work. Let's say that we want to put um, this face, you know, a pattern like this on this face. I already have that face selected, uh, created. Let's see which one it is. Whoops. I think I changed something. I think I had a thing highlighted and then I, uh, I selected all of the faces. Wow. It might create stuff on everything now. And it's going to take a long time. Down here at the bottom are your progress bars. Let's just undo that because I changed the selection right here and, and unintentionally. So let's say, let's, which one of these is which? All right, so that that's that one. So there's that face selected. Um, so if I want to apply a pattern to that face, then um, we click on, well, w there's different ways you can do this. I, I typically click on the thing I want to do. So then um, I could drag this up here, or if I want to keep this as a rep, like I could drag this here um, and just drop it in there. Um, and so that's saying what CAD face I want. Um, and then the feature tolerance, if I want to set that, I think I changed this to 500. Um, I changed that to 15. I think these were ones on both of them. And then it'll start processing it. And there's that pattern on that face. If I want to see the others, then I need to turn that other one back on there. Um, they don't automatically line up here. That's kind of why I went with the hexagon because it was regular, a regular pattern and it did line up. Um, these are random patterns, or at least they have some randomness to them. So they don't, they line up in a couple of places, but not everywhere. And I didn't like that. Um, if I want to see the body, the body itself is here. So there's kind of what I would end up printing. Now this would take forever to print because of all the little retractions it would have to do. And it would be very messy with a um, TPU part, I believe. Um, but that's just, that's that's a way faster way to generate this geometry and then do it over and over and over again. Like you could take pretty pretty easy. You could take and put a hexagon pattern. You just use a linear pattern. You could do that in SolidWorks. Um, the the thing that you get over here is easy manipulation of that pattern so i don't i have a easier time manipulating i might have a more predictable time manipulating it in solidworks just because i'm more familiar with solidworks but here if i if i think eh, that's too dense it's really easy to you know go in and change it to a different number and it regenerates the whole pattern um now a pattern a linear pattern in solidworks i can do a similar thing i can change the instances of it but um, it doesn't automatically change the size of the pattern. I can just change the number of them and it will, won't have them all connected together. So I'd have to recreate the initial pattern in order to change the size of it. So I have to know a lot more ahead of time if I am trying to make this thing work in a process like SolidWorks. I have to do a lot of parameterization to make it as easily changeable. I um, mean, I think that's one of the strong, sweet suits of uh, this type of software. And I don't know many other pieces of software like this one. Um, there might be others. Um, so it, again, it's more of an industrial tool. Apparently you can get a demo and get you a 14-day uh, trial that seems to be unlocked uh, so that you could use it. I assume the price is out of reach for a consumer. Um, so it really would be something that you're in the additive manufacturing business and uh you want this to for your for your industry um i have no idea what the price is <laughs> you know usually i know if you have to request a quote that um it is going to be expensive and uh probably and not a hobby level thing but it's still um you know if you could take two weeks and pick up some of this that does give you some skills that you can uh, put on a resume and uh, familiar with in topology additive manufacturing 
design software or whatever they label themselves um, and uh, give you a couple of different options for um, job opportunities, um, particularly related to additive fabrication, additive manufacturing. Um, so, and there are industries out there that are additive based manufacturing, you know, not your typical CNC away some aluminum or whatever. Um, there are smaller industries or, or very specific industries that have this kind of need. Um, they also give the uh, uh, some other examples. They, they weren't on their webpage anymore. I'm not sure why, because to me, they were actually really good examples um, of not necessarily using this as a um, generator for you know topology optimization or things like that, but using it for um, fixturing and tool holding and things like that, where maybe you have uh, a... a fixture that's a unique shape that you need to generate a part you want to hold in a mill so that you can do your traditional manufacturing processes on it but it requires a really unique fixture um, part of what you can do with this is bring the CAD model of that part in and easily build fixtures for it or plating you know you make a whole bunch of things and they have to be plated onto a, a basically a part so you know how when you've got all your parts made or whatever um, or a tool holder things like that where this kind of software would fit well into traditional manufacturing. So you're not manufacturing the end product, you're manufacturing pieces that help make the end product. Um, and I don't see that on their examples anymore, but I actually thought that was one of their better examples for how this could fit in a non-additive manufacturing based industry. Um, but I don't see them here anymore. All right, next time what we're gonna do um, at least what I have written down to do is go through a uh, SolidWorks thermal simulation of the hot end. So just kind of a last little thing. Uh, won't have a lot to do with 3D printing other than the thing that we're simulating is part of a 3D printer. The most, well, arguably the most important part of the 3D printer. Um, I guess you can't leave many of the parts out and it still work though. So um, we're going to run through a SolidWorks thermal simulation just so you can kind of see some heat distributions in the hot end and, and hopefully have a good idea of how those things work and what the important pieces are. Um, we kind of talked about that way back at the very beginning. Um, so I kind of thought this would be a good place to, to end it. Um, Friday, we don't actually meet on Friday, um, but there is a survey. Um, do I, I don't I guess I still, oh yeah, it's right here. Um, there's a survey right here. Well, it's actually a quiz. I call it quiz three. Um, and it does count as a grade, but it's really a survey about your opinions on things we can make the class better by doing or not doing. Um, and so it's five questions, I think, five or six questions that you can answer. Um, and that'll, that'll do it. Make sure you get your options turned in. Um, we'll, I'll work on getting those graded. Uh, I wish that the way that I'm turning them in, so I'm turning them in using... Uh, the post here and uh, I wish it would automatically send it to the grade book but it's not going to do that I don't think so I have to so you do, your grade book looks empty but um, I'm putting the grades in the post itself so um, the grade book just is going to be empty I, maybe I'll go back and put it in the grade book at some point too but um, really the grades are kind of in these forums uh, and comments about them looks like I've got a bunch to do there all right, um, we'll be back Wednesday with some SolidWorks. And um, if, you're, if you're having trouble getting something working on your printer, you've got a couple of days left to, to ask me questions. Um, I'll still keep the, the Discord runs all the time. So if you end up, you know, a month or two from now and having a question, you can still post questions in the Discord um, if you're still part of it. Um, and we'll try to answer them if I know the answer. Uh, all right, see you all on Wednesday.